But anyway, without further ado, it'll be good to get the patient's perspective. And um, representing that here today is Dermot Good. Uh, Dermot is, uh, I feel a bit like myself, he's been around a while, and that's for sure. Um, he's a leading expert in healthcare benefits in Ireland. Uh, he's over 25 years experience in healthcare, having worked with VHI, Bupa Ireland, and the healthcare consultancy roles with the Irish Pension Trust and Mercer Limited. Um, he's published, or sorry, he's established uh, PHI Consultancy Ireland Limited in 2009 um, to provide advice to all aspects of health for a cover in Ireland. And anybody in the, uh, this industry knows Dermot well because he's well quoted as the leading expert um, in giving advice. In, in, with his, his particular trade name is uh, Total Healthcare, or sorry, uh, Total Health Cover. Um, and this is definitely his realm. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Dermot to the stage. Thank you. Now, good afternoon, everybody. Um, can everybody hear me down the back? Because I'm, I'm mic'd up. If I stand behind the podium, nobody will see me. So that's my, that's my, my reason for doing that. So um, what I want to do over the next, and by the way, first of all, I want to thank Bill and, and all of his team for the invitation to talk to you, because this is the first conference that I've ever, and I do lots of these talking about how to save money on health insurance and so on. It's the first time I've ever been asked to speak solely about the patient and to see the patient up there, I suppose, as part of one of the main themes of the conference is, is a huge step forward. Um, and I am, as you'll probably gather as I go through the next 15, 20 minutes, I am passionate about the customer. And I'm going to talk about the customer and the patient interchangeably. Um, and I speak to hundreds, thousands of customers on healthcare every year. People in companies, voluntary schemes, individuals, families. And what I want to try and do today is just share with you just to put it into perspective exactly, exactly how they feel, exactly what their journey looks like. And this, will, by the way, will be some of you as well. Um, so that's what I'm going to go through in the next 15, 20 minutes. I, I will, if this works for me, yes. I'm, I'm also going to talk to you about, as well as looking at the journey, and I can't help this, by the way, so at the end of the presentation, I'm going to show you just what some of the best deals are right now. So forgive me if I digress for a little bit. And let me just say just a couple of statistics straight away for you. I assume most of you in this room have private health cover, and it is getting more expensive and so on. I'm telling you now, four out of five of you in the room are on the wrong plans. And this one out of every two of you could potentially half your costs if you looked at this properly. So we'll talk more about that at the end. That's the reason why I always do that is to stop you leaving to take an early lunch. But anyway. Okay, so um, let's look at the patient journey. And you know what? All the marketeers in the room spend a lot of money analyzing the patient journey, or your customer journey, rather. You know, and, and what's their experience? And can we streamline it and make their experience better? And we're always looking those extra inches we can, we can squeeze out of that journey you know, to cut out costs and make the journey better. And I suppose my question is, well, what would that look like if we did that for the patient or the customer? And do we do it? And I think we do it in some sectors, and we don't do it that well in other sectors. So I worked in VHI for 12 years, um, did my apprenticeship there. And in VHI, you know, we always, well, what did the customer want? And I want to just share with you this right now in terms of, you know, me as a customer, as a consumer, as a patient, and all of you as well. So what exactly are they looking for? And, you know, the main word we had then was certainty. And patients want certainty of cover. They want to know that if I go into that facility, I'm going to get in, I will be treated, and, and, and let's just say I'll have a positive experience. And now it's moved on because people now, you know, they want access and control. They're the two words I use all the time. So I do not want to wait three months for an urgent colonoscopy or for an urgent MRI scan. I do not want my child to wait six months for a tonsillectomy and I'm pumping them full of antibiotics. And then also people want control. I want to decide which hospital, which accommodation, which consultant. And I also maybe want to decide when I go in and get treated. And that's why a lot of people have private cover. So there are some key requirements and other requirements as well. I mean, basic stuff. I want to be treated with respect. You know, I mean, I am a patient. I'm vulnerable. I'm not well. And I want people to treat me with respect. I also want, let's just say, I want to get value. And the value proposition has been diminished significantly. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. And also, we all want positive outcomes, obviously. Um, and look, you know, in terms of life expectancy, I'm going to talk about some of the new services that are available now as well. I mean, the outcomes that we now see are, you know, have advanced hugely over the last few years as well. So let's just look at the patient experience. And, you know, sorry to be negative here, but let's just put up right now what patients, what people are telling me. And look, you all know this as well. So, you know, I find it's ironic. People now get stressed about going into hospital. You know, it worries them. They're worried well. I mean, we all hear that phrase now. So we worry about waiting lists. And there are waiting lists. And I'm not going to repeat these because 
they've already been put up. But you know what? Some of the statistics, I said three months for an urgent colonoscopy and three months, let's just say, for an urgent MRI. There's people waiting 12 months. Those that shout the loudest maybe get seen in three months. And people waiting two years for a hip replacement, that's just absolutely nonsense. You know? and, and that's what it is. Affordability is now a big issue for most consumers. So they want health care. And look, you know, we, are, we are Irish, right? We want the best health care, but I want it cheaper. Okay, so you know, that's not going to happen. And by the way, anybody in this room who maybe is paying less than 1,000 euro for their private cover, 850, 750, you don't really have health insurance. Let's be quite honest. You need to be spending 11, 1,200 euro per adult to have decent cover, or maybe more than that. Okay, so just to put that into perspective, you know, so wanting it, you know, and obviously want, being willing to pay for it are two separate things as well. There's huge confusion in the market as well, huge confusion, particularly amongst older people. And, you know, we talk about confidence. You have to have confidence in the system. We have to trust the system. And, you know, I'm not going, well, everybody can decide this for themselves, but right now there is a lack of confidence. And then we have the public versus private. And, look, we talk about this two-tier system, and nobody wants this two-tier system. Well, I'm sorry, that system is here to stay, and that divide is going to get wider. And government policy is actually widening that as well, okay? You know, and that's why, when you think of it now, 46% of the population have private cover. And I think, and I'm going to talk about the outcomes now in a moment from the private system, but more than half the population do not have private cover. And with lifetime community rating, a lot of those people will never be able to afford private cover. So let me just look at maybe just a, a few touch points, let's just say, in terms, of, um, in terms of healthcare. So let's look at the GP. So I think the GP, primary care, I think it works very, very well. You know, we can all go to a GP pretty much straight away. Lots of times at the end of my presentations, people do feel unwell and they go to their GP. You know, so you can phone your GP. In fact, now those of you, depending on the policy you have, you can book a consultation on your smartphone right now, and you can sneak out your car in an hour's time and have a conversation with your GP, okay? So the only thing I would say about GPs is that, by the way, for everybody in the room here as well, maybe pay 60 euro for your GP consultation. You all should be on plans that give you 50% back on those consultations, and most people are not on those plans. And the only issue I have with GPs is their referral practices. Too many GPs send people to the same private facilities or the same hospitals without having any knowledge of whether they're even covered. And too many GPs send people into the public system and don't prepare them for what's going to happen. Okay, so, you know, GPs have a role to play there as well, but by and large, that works well. Private hospitals. And look, you know, the feedback I get, and even my own personal experiences, and it's not perfect, but the private system, despite all the challenges for the private hospitals, it does work very, very well. Okay, and by the way, you know, the public system is taking 150 million off all of us who have private health insurance right now. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But now we have the Bonds Group who are investing 150 million in new facilities. And the only thing I'd say to the private hospital community is that you don't do enough to tell consumers what you're doing. And if you did, then people might think twice about reducing their cover. So the Bonds are building a new cat lab in Galway. And even when I say cat lab, for a lot of consumers, what does that mean? Okay? A new endoscopy unit in Dublin and so forth. They have this new piece of technology now, which is the pill cam which just before lunch, I'm not going to do it to your eyes, but it's a fantastic piece of technology. And by the way, they're not the only hospital. So the Hermitage Clinic, which is just a stone's throw from here as well, has a new neurosurgery uh, theater that they just built. And they are the only ones with this cyber knife technology for previously what were tumors that couldn't be operated on. And other hospitals like the Beacon, they're all investing. And you know why? Competition. Because we have real competition and they want to look after the patient. You know, and I suppose my next question is, we look at the, at the public system, and I suppose, and by the way, let me just talk, say this very, very clearly, I'm talking about the system. I'm not talking about the people who basically work hard on those systems, okay? Under terrible pressure in there, we all know what that's like. You know, but if you look at the public system right now, it is absolutely problematic. And let me just expand on that, and I'm gonna try and not maybe duplicate what others have spoken about here already, but people here might think the public system is free. It's not free. You must pay up to 750 euro a year, and that's for children as well. So anybody here is thinking of taking that 25-year-old who won't leave home, okay, and you're still paying for them, and you all have them, don't take them off the policy. Keep them on some cover because they will pay that amount. And then we have the waiting lists, and we all know what those waiting lists are. And by the way, people think kids get special treatment. Of the figures that Bill put up earlier on of 78,000 people waiting for surgery right now, who've had their first consultation, 4,600 of them are children who will wait for elective surgery. So this idea, you'll hear journalists saying, oh, you don't need to cover your children, you know, they're well covered. They all have their kids insured, okay? So just be very, very careful with that. And then the public system, and once again, in terms of looking after the patient, 
looking after the customer. What did the public system do two years ago? They used to set aside 20% of their beds for private patients. And there used to be semi-private rooms. We all know what semi-private means. Semi-private is no more. I made the mistake, by the way, once of saying semi-private is no more than five in a bed. I'd say if we had those policies, we'd all buy them. But anyway, semi-private is no more than five in the ward, OK? But you know what they did? They did away with the semi-private room. And they have this fantastic phrase now, multi-occupancy room. And you know what that is? That is a fantastic phrase for a public ward, OK? With anybody and everybody. But the real thing, which is, you know, this is shocking. This is shocking now what's going on. And everybody's touched on this already. Let me just explain this to everybody now. And by the way, we wouldn't tolerate this in any other industry at all. And this is, we're paying for this. So Dermot Good goes into one of the public hospitals this afternoon. They admit me. They find that I have health insurance. I've gone in the public door, which I'm absolutely entitled to go public. They can only charge me 75 euro per night. That's my entitlement. I pay for that. But what they'll do is somebody will appear by my bedside and they'll say, Dermot, we see you have health insurance. You just sign this form here. We'll treat you as a private patient. And don't worry, Dermot, it's fully covered by your insurance. OK? So I'll sign the form, because I don't know any better. And what I've done is I've actually signed them in my right to be treated as a public patient. And that person will go off. Nothing will change for me. I'll stay in the same bed. Nothing will change. I'll see the same doctor. But now they'll charge my insurance company 813 euro per night, and nothing will change for me. And we wouldn't tolerate that in any other industry where they are charging you for private treatment that you don't get. So I'd say to everybody here, and if you work in a company and you represent a company, you need to tell your employees, you don't have to sign that form. You're perfectly entitled to say, no, do you know what? In fact, what you should say is, well, by the way, if I sign this, will I get a private room? Or will I get that private doctor over there? Or will I get in more quickly? And they will say, well, look, we can't really guarantee that. And your answer has to be, well, you know what? Come back to me when you have the private room and I'll sign the form. And they will simply move over to the next patient and try them. OK, and it gets worse. It gets worse, right? So now if Dermot Good signs this form, the doctor who's on duty that day, who's going to attend me anyway, will now see, oh my god, this guy has signed the form. I'm going to charge him a private charge, even though he was going to treat me anyway. And it gets worse again, because when Dermot Good comes back in in three or four months' time to have my follow-up ultrasound, they'll see, this guy is private. So instead of me getting that for free, they might say, Dermot, that's 220 euro, please. So all I'd say to you, know your rights. Okay, and it's not free. You are paying for this. Two of the insurance companies have just increased their rates. More will follow, I've no doubt. And it's down to this charge. So be very, very mindful of that, please. Okay, let me look at the insurance companies now and tell you what people are saying. And by the way, and we have representatives here from all the insurance companies, which is great. But by the way, there's some other companies up there put up, like VSP and DCARE and HSF. When I talk about health insurance, I talk about total health care. Okay, most people don't even know about these other products. They're fantastic products, you don't even know about them. So, the health insurance companies, well, on the negative side, look, we have rate increases, and look, previous speakers have already covered this, and we have policy excesses. They, by the way, have no choice. They have to do this. They have to maintain minimum solvency, and you know what? I'm surprised the increases haven't been higher, given some of the pressures that they're under, okay? And by the way, that is set to continue. So, some people here, as I say, who are paying seven, eight, nine hundred euro, you might think you are covered for everything. You are not covered for everything, okay? But on the plus side, you know, the insurance companies now have invested hugely in cost containment measures. And, you know, our rate increases will be much higher if they weren't doing a lot of this behind the scenes. So a lot of them have these special investigation units. I, mean, I think they watch too much of these, whatever, Miami Vice and these programs. Whatever. But they have these units. Some people here have probably got phone calls after they came out of hospital to say, were you five nights in that private room? Did you see that doctor ten times? That's them trying to manage costs. And there's huge innovation. I'm going to show you now in a moment some things that you don't even know you have on your plans. And this is competition again, and this is to be welcomed. And by the way, the insurance companies now, they're focusing on wellness. So when anybody who works in a company scheme, you are probably getting health screening, you're getting lots of on-site services from supported and financed and organized by your health insurance company purely to try and keep you well at work. The question is, how do we, how do we expand that to individual consumers as well? So I'm not going to go through all of these, but let me just tell you, most of you don't even know you have this. You know, the backup program there is fantastic. That was an innovation from Aviva Health. The personalized packages was an innovation from Glow Health. Nobody, even right now, nobody still does that, OK? The, the um, care in the home thing is a VHI initiative that everybody here with VHI doesn't even know they have. Leia were the first ones to ever bring in an infertility benefit, even though your policy terms and conditions states it's not covered. So this is the benefit of competition. And really what I would say to the private hospitals and to the insurance companies, you need to do more to tell your customers exactly what their entitlements are. Because then they might think twice about downgrading, or reducing their cover, or cancelling their cover. Okay? 
But that's the kind of thing, and by the way, everybody in this room, if you're on one of these good corporate plans, which I'll show you now in a moment, you get 50% back on all your routine expenses. So why would you not think twice? I wouldn't think twice about going to a private hospital to get an x-ray or to get a scan, because I'm going to get half of it back. So let's just look at advisors for a second. And look, I am one of those advisors. I operate on a fee basis across all, let's just say, insurance companies. Um, and there's lots of advisors, advisors out there. But look, one of the problems I have with advice, I speak to too many people who have downgraded their cover. Because you know what? The advice is given based on price, on cost. So somebody tells me they're spending 2,000. Someone will basically put them on a plan that's maybe 900 euro. And they walk away. And the men are the worst of this, by the way. The men will think 1,100 euro, done. And then the women will come in and go, hang on a second now. What about the kids and what about this existing condition? And you need to do that. I've often had to say to people, you know what? You should be spending more on your cover based on what you've said to me. But absolutely do not downgrade your policy because here's what it'll cost you if you downgrade. And they're the kind of conversations we need to be having. Too much of it is done around cost. Not enough people switch. Not enough people shop around. So the insurance companies, can they do more? Yes, they can. Um, you know, and look, lots of it's already been covered by previous speakers, but I'd love to see every person getting a health screen. I'm getting a treatment plan. Now, obviously, there's a cost. I'm sure now some of the insurers in the room are going, we're going to talk to him later now. But, how, but anyway, but that's what they should be doing. Um, and here's another thing. The insurance company should be putting incentives in place. And this was done before when Booper Ireland came into the marketplace, and the product was basically ruled out of order. I don't think it is. So why wouldn't every person who doesn't sign that form in a public hospital, who saves the insurance company 800 euro per night, why wouldn't there be an incentive for them to do that, to act responsibly? If I'm covered for a private room and I stay semi-private, why isn't there a kickback? And it doesn't undermine community raising whatsoever. It just, undermine, or just supports positive, responsible usage of your cover. So we need to think like that. And I also think the insurance company needs to challenge the legislation. Smokers. Smokers should not, let's just say, be treated the exact same as those who don't smoke. Okay? So we need to look at where we can basically amend the legislation without undermining community raising. And the education piece I've already covered as well. So, just before I finish on, on just, the, the, I suppose, the market perspective from the, or from the consumer's point of view, and everybody's touched on this, but look at things like long-term care. There's no strategy in this country for long-term care. It's frightening. You know, right now it's frightening. Never mind what it'll be like in 40 or 25 years' time. Mental health provision is another huge area. I mean, if you have health insurance, you're covered for great facilities like Highfield, John of God's, St. Pat's, fantastic facilities. But if you don't have health insurance, let's just say, the, the, the treatment pathway, if you call it that, is not so good, okay? Um, and maybe that's all I'd say in that. Just on the aging population, this has already been covered by previous speakers. And the middle point there, look, the number of people that are going over 65 in the next 25 years is going to nearly triple. And by the way, as my wife said to me, that's you. So I'm going to be one of them, okay? And most of us in the room, that is us. And the number of people aged 80 plus will also nearly triple in the same time period. So if we think we have a challenge right now, and everybody said this, the challenge going forward is monumental. Okay, just by way of wrap up, I did say I would do this. Um, and the whole purpose behind this is that maybe hopefully to try and save some people some money. So on the way home, you stop in Kandare Village and you blow it all. Okay, um, so look, let me just say to you straight away, too many people are on the wrong plans. Too many people don't shop around. Too many people don't have health insurance. They don't think they need it. Too many people don't switch their cover. These are plans I've selected right across the spectrum. All insurance companies are represented. There are people in this room now paying 2,000 euro for your cover and pretty much the same benefits, minor changes, same benefits. You can save, let's just say, 800 euro there, thereabouts. And the same for families. That family package there that I mentioned, they're pretty much like for like. And by the way, sometimes you don't even have to change insurance company. And too many people do not change for the wrong reasons. They don't shop around for the wrong reasons. And if you're one of them, we'll get somebody to do it for you if you're fearful of change. Because there are phenomenal benefits out there. There's 365 plans in the market right now. And there's plans there to suit every budget. And even if you're a company scheme, by the way, that company, that's, that's an actual example of a company who basically saved about 12, 15%, pretty much the exact same benefits. Sometimes, depending on how old your plan is, you can basically increase your benefits quite significantly and pay less for the cover that you need. And that's a summary look of the best corporate plans in the market right now. Look, and by the way, I'm not saying those plans are for everybody, but you can see there's huge competition amongst the insurance companies. You know, and the average premium is around 1,200 euro. There's lots of you in the room that are paying a significant amount more than that. And you know what? Some of the benefits that are on those plans, you don't even have those benefits. So shopping around is, 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 is imperative. So the outlook for the future. All I'd say to you is that, and I'm going to try and finish on a positive note if I can here, but look, there will be more price hikes. 
And that's inevitable. And look, I was talking to one of the representatives from one of the health insurers just before um, we came back in for the second session. There's a new drug on the market now for breast cancer. It's 80,000 euro. There's other cancer drugs that are 90, 100,000 euro. We all want to be covered for them, but that comes with a price tag. And you know what? All the procedures, and I've just given you a sample of some of them, but there's other technologies being developed amongst the private hospitals and also the public hospitals, but primarily the private hospitals. I want to be covered for them. Okay, I do not want to be subject, let's just say, to the old technologies or waiting. I want that. And if that comes with a price tag, well, I'm happy to pay. But when I see the public hospitals taking 150 million off of me for no extra value, now that's, that should not be acceptable at all. Um, the public system pressures will continue. I mean, look, government ministers have already pretty much told us, expect it to get worse before it gets better. Those, let's just say, figures are increasing in terms of waiting lists. And you know something? People are now becoming more accepting of this. I mean, people are saying to me, eh, I waited 14 hours in A&E. I mean, that's just shocking. You know, a colleague of mine up the north, four hours in A&E, paid nothing, fantastic treatment. You know, that's just, and the problem is now, I think we're beginning to become too accepting of what's going on. That should not be the case. Um, and that public-private divide is going to widen. And all I'd say is those of you who have health insurance, yes, the private system is doing everything it can, as is evidenced by today, to try and, let's just say, look after you better, manage you better. But what about those people who can't afford private cover? You know, and with the age loadings now, most people who didn't get in at time, they're gone. They will not be able to afford to get in. So that's not good, okay? So that's a serious issue. So I suppose in terms of the patient perspective, just to finish where I started, yes, there are reasons to be optimistic. And this, this conference is absolutely one of them. And when I see what's going on with the health insurance companies and the private hospitals, you know, they are absolutely, because of huge competition, they are focused on the patient. I think we need to get all the stakeholders together. As was said last night, a very good speech given by Jim Dowdle on this thing. Everybody needs to be part of the solution. Without everybody, there will be no solution. I hope that's informative. Thank you very much for your time.